Today's reading is from Matthew, chapter 7, verses 24 through 29, the wise and foolish builders. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against the house, and it fell with a great crash. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. The word of God for the people of God. Good morning, village people. My name's Travis. I'm one of the pastors here, and I'm glad to be here in a middle school cafeteria with you this morning. Uh, welcome to Church in a School. It's an exciting time. So uh, we, got word, um, we got word several weeks ago that they were going to be redoing the gym floor in the middle school. And so we said, great, can we have church in the gym in the elementary school? And they said, absolutely. And then we got word that they were going to be redoing the gym floor in the elementary school. So we said, can we have church in the cafeteria? They said, yes. So that's why we're here. Uh, everybody take your paintbrush. And uh, if you'll follow Jeff, you're in the back. Can you wave your hand? If you'll follow Jeff down the hall, we're going to help them on the refinishing <laughs> pro project. Uh, that's why we're here. It's uh, not sent Sunday, but we're going to serve. Um, I'm so glad you're here, especially if you were here with us for the first time this morning. Uh, maybe, maybe you had a, a kid who came to camp with us this week, and you wanted to check out what this is all about. We are so glad to have you. Um, I can't say thank you enough to our, uh, to our camp leaders. Some of you are in here. If you, if you were one of our leaders this week, would you just raise your hand? Let us thank you again uh, for all of your work to make that happen. Really, really great week, so thank you. Thank you for that. I want to pray uh, as we're continuing this morning. God, thank you that whether or not we are in a middle school gym or an elementary school gym or a middle school cafeteria or wherever we might be, that you promise to be there with us. We thank you for your presence here. God, we, uh, we're here this morning, as we're here every Sunday, hoping to hear from you. Some of us are really, really hoping to hear from you. Some of us are not sure if you even speak, but we're curious <laughs> that if you did speak, what you might say. And so no matter, no matter where we are, God, on the spectrum of faith, I pray that you would speak to us as we're gathered here a word that we need to hear. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Everybody said, amen. amen. Last year, I joined a gym. Thank you. I'm, you can probably, I know you can tell looking at it, right? No comments, no comments. So uh, I joined Get Fit on the Go, which is the closest gym to my house. It's just a little bit south of Lenox Village. And, um, and on New Year's Eve, actually what I said, I went in and I talked to the owner and I said, um, I actually said these words. I said, so Jesus says, uh, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I'd like to sign up for a year because I'm hoping where my treasure is, there my butt will be also. And so I, I committed to a year. And last year on New Year's Eve, um, I decided that I was going to make a goal um, thinking forward, I turned 40 in March, I was thinking forward to turning 40, and I just, I wanted to be in better shape, I wanted to kind of, you know, blow past that line of turning 40, and so for almost three months between December 31st and March 23rd, which is my birthday, go ahead, take a minute, mark that on your calendar. Okay, between those, nobody moved, I'm, I'm not offended, nobody moved, but anyway, so between those dates, December 31st, March 23rd, I got up every single weekday morning at 5.15. I got up before 5.15. I was in the gym at 5.15. I was paying somebody to whoop my tail and to have other people around me who might keep me accountable. It was much better than just going to the rec center and looking at the machines, right? I actually had people who were making me work out and yelling at me about it, which is apparently what I needed. And so uh, I had made this goal that I was going to work out 50 times. I wanted to work out at least 50 times between December 31st and my birthday, March 23rd. I had this countdown tracker on a dry erase board in our house, and every morning I'd come back in, I'd erase the number, I'd write the, the lower number on there. Um, I didn't miss a single day unless I was out of town, and even then, 
I'd arranged it with one of the trainers there that while I was traveling, she would send me the workout for the day. I'd go to the hotel gym where I was staying. I'd try to figure out what to do with the limited equipment there, but I did not miss a workout between December 31st and March 23rd. I got my goal. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. I feel really good about it. Um, I had a hashtag in my head, hashtag fit by 40, which I stole from a friend and I started to make some gains. I almost found an ab that I hadn't seen since I was 18, and I almost found it. I mean, it was so close to being there. I was feeling great. Then on March 24th, I turned 40 March 23rd. Then on March 24th, I was 40. I was fitter than I had been in a long time, and I didn't have a goal. I didn't have a hashtag. I didn't have a tracker on a dry erase board in my house, and now between March 24th and today, I have missed way more days than I have gone to the gym. This is a problem. And so I, I've lost, just in the last three months, I've lost almost all of the gains that I'd made. Yeah, I can no longer, thank you, yeah. <laughs> My ab is nowhere in sight. Like, I, I can't even see where my ab was starting to emerge. I have no, you know, I have no idea where it is. Now, the, the good thing is I'm still a member of the gym. I still got some workout clothes. Um, as a reward, as a reward for hitting my goal of, of, of 50 times working out, my family got me an Apple Watch so that I could track my workouts. But now all it's saying to me every day is, Travis, you have failed to reach your activity goals for the day. So I feel really good about that. Now, it's one thing to believe in fitness. It's another thing altogether to get fit. It's one thing to believe in nutrition. It's another thing to eat healthy. It's one thing to know what to do with a weight. It's another thing to pick it up and do the thing with the weight, right? Um, if you're a married man, uh, husbands, it is one thing to, to go home and say to your wife, I cleaned the kitchen. It's another thing to go home and say, hey, I want you to know I thought about unloading the dishwasher. Um, <laughs> And, and later, I'm going to have some, I want to have some friends over, I want to have some of my guy friends over, and we're going to do a study of what it would look like if I unloaded the dishwasher. We're going to get on the Pinterest, and we're going to look at pictures of clean kitchens. I'm going to memorize the phrase, I clean the kitchen in Greek and Hebrew, so that I can say that to you. It is one thing, I, in fact, go home, try that, and see what happens, and then just like, Report back to me about what that, you know, what that would look like in your house. This is a fundamental truth in life. You can learn everything there is to learn about a thing. And when you learn about that thing, you might know more about that thing. You might, you might feel better about what you know about that thing. You might be able to have a conversation about that thing. But until you do that thing, whatever that thing is, until you actually do the thing, it makes no difference in your life. The same principle applies to our faith, right? It's kind of what Jesus is talking about here in this, in this teaching at the end of what's called the Sermon on the Mount. And so uh, based on these words from Jesus, what I want to do this morning for just a couple minutes is I want to I talk to you and help you understand about how Jesus and Alan Iverson are different. Just go with me. I mean, maybe you've had difficulty telling them apart in the past, and I want to do whatever I can to help you with that this morning. And so uh, I just want to help you differentiate between the two. I know this is a struggle. Um, Allen Iverson, minute, yeah, thank you. I loved watching Allen Iverson play, right? He was a point guard. Uh, most of his career, he was with the Sixers. He was the first pick in the 96 draft. He was an 11-time All-Star. He was inducted into the Hall of Fame, I think, in 2016. For most of, the, most of his career, he led the league in minutes played per game. I, I loved watching this guy play. I really did love watching him, him play. But in, somewhere in, in 2002, I think, there was, there was a little bit of controversy about his, uh, about his efforts in practice which led to, one, I think, one of the most iconic NBA press conferences in history. And so if you are not culturally aware, I want to show it to you this morning. I would like you to see the press conference so that you know what I'm talking about. Ladies and gentlemen, Allen Iverson. It's easy to sum it up when you just talk about practice. We sitting here, I'm supposed to be the franchise player, and we're in here talking about practice. I mean, it, listen, we're talking about practice. Not a game, not a game, not a game. We're talking about practice, not a game. 
not 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 the game that I go out there and, and die for and play every game like it's my last. Not the game. We're talking about practice, man. I mean, how silly is that? Man, we're talking about practice. I know I'm supposed to be there. I know I'm supposed to lead by example. I know that. And I'm not I'm not shoving it aside, you know, like it don't mean anything. I know it's important. I do. I honestly do. But we talking about practice, man. What are we talking about? Practice? We talking about practice, man. We, talk, we talking about practice. We talking about practice. We ain't talking about the game. We talking about practice, man. When you come into the arena and you see me play, you see me play, don't you? You see me give everything I got, right? But we talking about practice right now. We talking about practice. Man, I look, I hear you. I, it's funny to me, too. I, I mean, it's strange, it's strange to me, too. But we talking about practice, man. We not even talking about the game, the actual game, when it matters. We talking about practice. Alan, is it possible, though, that from where he's coming from? I don't know if you caught what they were talking about. Anybody count how many times he said practice? Anybody know? 16. He said, he said practice 16 times in that press conference, uh, which was awesome. And so uh, here, here's the thing. According to the words of Jesus that Joy read for us a minute ago from Matthew chapter 7, here's the difference between Jesus and Allen Iverson. Jesus is all about practice, right? G if, in case you didn't know, Jesus is all about practice. Jesus speaks practice. It's practice. No, I'm sorry. Uh, so Jesus speaks these words. He speaks these words at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. It's the, the, the lengthiest series or section of teaching. It's the most direct and practical teaching that Jesus ever gives to his disciples. And at the end of it, here's what he says. Joy read this a minute ago. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. So th this teaching, I mean, it covers the gamut of human experience. He's, he's talking about what it means to be a human ethically and, and morally and financially and spiritually and relationally. It's not just some good suggestions. Jesus is not just giving some good suggestions for us to consider here in the Sermon on the Mount. He's, he's trying to teach the people what it means to live the best possible way as a human being in this world and in this life. And he says the, the way to achieve that is practice. It's through practice. He, he concludes this. And I can, I can just hear somebody, I can just hear one of the disciples in the crowd calling out, Jesus, are you talking about practice? And he's like, yes, I'm talking about practice. It's exactly what I'm talking about. He's all about practice. For Jesus, it's not just about watching the game or learning the game or memorizing the playbook. It's not about breaking down the film. It's about practice. He's saying your life will not be different. If you want your life to be different, if you want to experience the fullness of what it means to be a human being in this life, your life will not be changed by the knowledge of God alone. Right? Your life will not be changed by what you've memorized in life. Those things are important. Knowing God is important. Memorizing the words of God is important. But it's only important so far as it leads you to a different practice, a different way of living. It's not about the game. It's about taking what you've learned from Jesus and applying it to your life. And the idea is, the whole idea of the Sermon on the Mount, the whole idea of Jesus' ministry and mission is that when you do that, when you begin to take the words of Jesus, the teachings of Jesus, the actions of Jesus, and when you begin to apply them, put them into practice in your life, you start to become something that you could never become on your own. Things in your life begin to change in this real, tangible, beautiful kind of way. Your relationships become more meaningful. Your parenting becomes more intentional. Your attitude becomes more hopeful. Friends, we could use some more people in this community and in this world who have attitudes that are more hopeful and less jaded. Amen on that? Amen. This only happens when we begin to put the words of Jesus into practice. Your interactions with other people become more positive. Your actions become more helpful. All, all, of, all 
as a result of taking these words of Jesus and not just thinking about them or chewing on them or memorizing them or learning them in the Greek, but actually living them out. And little by little, before you know it, you start to find that your life takes on this new form, this new character. Things begin to change. Sometimes for us, when we put the words of Jesus into practice, things change in our lives that we didn't know needed to change. But when they start to change, we're able to look back and see, man, we, we actually did need to change. We needed a lot of change after all. Last night, Amanda and I went to, uh, we went to a surprise party. Uh, and it was a, a different kind of surprise party. It wasn't a surprise birthday party. But my friend Justin, uh, on June 27th, 2019, had just graduated from high school. Uh, he was out late at night. Uh, he had been drinking heavily. He wrecked his car. He ended up in jail. He was a pastor's kid. This was after, uh, after a long series of trying to get his life together, of being sent to places like wilderness camp and treatment centers and, and doing all kinds of things. And, and he hit rock bottom. He went to jail. He was sitting in his jail cell uh, that night. And I can't exactly quote what he, what he prayed, but I can give you the gist of it. And it was, God, if you are real. I need you because I have really messed things up. If you are real, I need you because I have really messed things up. We met Justin six weeks later when he enrolled at Lambeth University where we went to college, and he became one of our very, very good friends. And last night, his wife threw him a surprise party for 20 years of sobriety. Amen to that. It was, it was, it was amazing, and he was so just floored and humbled and uh, and, and it's been so awesome for me to get to watch Justin over these past 20 years and see who he's become, to know where he's been and to know where he's become. Now, he didn't, he didn't become what he is today because he just memorized the AA book, right? He didn't just memorize the principles of what he learned in AA meetings, and he didn't just learn about the words of God and think they were really good ideas. He began to put them into practice, and it has fundamentally changed everything about his life. He's one of the most humble people that I know. He's one of the kindest people that I know. He serves people. He's a leader in his church. He loves God. He's got four beautiful kids, not because of the concepts, but because he took the words of Jesus and put them in to practice. We're right in the middle of this series called Love Does, based on the book Love Does by Bob Goff. He's got a chapter called Memorizing Jesus. I want to read you a little bit of this. He, he's talking about the difference between stalking Jesus and following Jesus. And he says this, at some point I had to confess that I was actually stalking Jesus. I was actually creeping myself out a little, and I realized I was probably creeping God out too, so I decided I'd stop. The first thing I did was quit going to what Christians call a Bible study. A Bible study sounds like a wholesome thing to do, and honestly it is. They can come in as many flavors as there are people leading them. At the ones I went to, I learned a bunch of facts and information about Jesus. We might be studying how a guy named Lazarus was raised from the dead by Jesus. And the leader would open up a reference book and say something like, the word dead means in Greek. And then he'd say, in the Hebrew, the word dead means... And sometimes he'd get really into it and talk about the difference between the Greek version of dead and the Hebrew version of dead. And then he'd ask us a compelling question like, when was the last time you felt dead? Huh? I asked myself, honestly, who really needs to hear a definition of dead? And what difference did it make? I wanted to talk about how I could do a better job following Jesus, how to practice kindness, and what might be possible to do with my faith before I'm the Greek or the Hebrew version of dead. He goes on, I love this part, what's up with equating Bible study with knowing God anyway? Wouldn't it be a horrible thing if we studied the ones we loved instead of bonding in deeper ways by doing things with them? I'd never want to get married to a girl no matter how much I studied her. I'd rather take her sailing or fishing or eat cotton candy with her on a Ferris wheel, and I don't think knowing what her name means in Greek is going to help me love her more. In fact, I love this part. In fact, they have a name for guys who just study things about a person they like but don't do anything about it. They're called bachelors. <laughs> so I started getting together with the same guys each week. Listen to this because this is something I think we could do. I started getting together with the same guys each week, and instead of calling it a Bible study, we called it a Bible doing. We've been at it for 15 years now, and I've found there's a big difference between the two. 
at our Bible doing, we read what God has to say, and then we focus all of our attention on what we are going to do about it. Just agreeing isn't enough. I can't think of a single time where Jesus asked his friends to just agree with him. When you came in this morning, there was a paintbrush. We've talked about a few, uh, a few ways to use the paintbrush. One is to refinish the gym floor. One is as a reminder to sign up for Scent Sunday. But I want you to take that and hold it in your hand. Take it out. I can actually see you in here to see if you're doing what I'm... This is not like the dark of the gym, right? So I, I'm watching. I can see. Take it out. Oh, thank you. I was about to call you by name, Matthew Pettifer. If you didn't... <laughs> I read this this week, and, and I thought it was, I thought it was a pretty on point with what we're talking about. Somebody said this, unapplied truth is like unapplied paint. It doesn't do anybody any good. The value is in the application. Unapplied truth is like unapplied paint. It doesn't do anybody any good. The value is in the application. The Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7, it's like Jesus brings in a paint can, and he opens it up, and he stirs it, and he hands it to us, and he hands us a brush, and he says, I've done as much as I can do. It's your job to take the paint from here and apply it. It's your job to take this truth, to take this paint, when you go to work, to apply it. It's your job to apply this when you go to school. It's your job to apply this when you get home. It's, it's your job to apply this in your marriage, in your parenting, in your relationships. Everything we do here, that's, that's our goal, that's our intention. What we're trying to do in, in Camp Village Kids this past week is to take a can, to, to, op to open up a can. That's not what I meant for that is to take a can to open it, to stir the paint together, to give practical tools, to, to, to equip people with the paint brushes, but the application of the paint is up to us. When we gather for worship, that's what we're doing. We're trying to open up. We're trying to open up God's word and to stir it together and to get it ready, and we're hoping to equip people with paint cans and paint brushes, but the job of application when you leave is yours. It's not just about what happens here. Unapplied truth is like unapplied paint. It doesn't do anybody any good. The power is in the application. And so what Jesus says at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, like he's, he's given this amazing practical teaching. And he says, the man or the woman who doesn't take the paintbrush and apply the paint that I've given them, that person is like a man or a woman who's built their house Ethically, morally, financially, relationally, it's like a person who's built their house on the sand. When the storms come, when the storms come, it can't withstand the storms. By the way, Jesus never says, if you follow me, there will never be any storms in your life. A lot of people want to think that or, or say that. It sounds really great, but it's not what Jesus says. Jesus never says, you'll never have any storms in life if you follow me. In fact, what he says is, when the storms come, those who take these words of mine and put them into practice are like a wise man or a wise woman who's built their house on the rock. When the storms come, that house will stand. So I want to leave you with, with what I think are simple questions. But I think they're the two most important questions that followers of Jesus can ask themselves in any time, any situation, any circumstance, any scenario. And it's simply this. Simply this. What is God saying to me in this? And what am I going to do about it? What is God saying to me in this? And what am I going to do about it? Right at the end of the day... At the end of the day, following Jesus isn't about the complexity of what you study. It's about the consistency of what you do. Right? It's not about the complexity of what I say. On some, that's not what makes this a great church. It's not about the complexity of what I say. It's not about how deeply I dig into the Greek and Hebrew and, and, and what we're like, just the amazing insight. It's not about the complexity. It's about the consistency of what we do. In your village group, it's not about the complexity of the study guide. 
is not about the complexity of your conversation. It's about the consistency of what we do together. What is God saying to me in this? And what am I going to do about it? When you open the Bible, what is God saying to me in this? What am I going to do about it? In your family, what is God saying to us in this? And what are we going to do about it? I'm going to pull back up two images that we started this series with. Uh, One is our, our beautiful mathematical equation. Just a reminder for us, if you have no idea why there's a Spock hand, go back, listen to week one. It'll explain it so well. If God is love, and if Jesus is God, then Jesus is love. Second line, and if Jesus is the embodiment of love, and if you are the body of Christ, which you are, that's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians, then you are the embodiment of love, and then love does is what you are. Love does, what love does is what we do. We've looked at this word, it's hundred. This, this list, it's 126 words. I don't know if you can see it in here this morning. These are the things that love does. These are the things that love applies in life. These are not just the concepts that we learn. These are not just the words that we memorize. These are not just the things that we think about as followers of Jesus. The power is in how we apply these to every situation, every scenario, every circumstance. So we're going to come to the communion table. We're going to have a time of prayer and communion this morning. Jesus didn't lead by by words and concepts alone. Jesus led by example. Jesus didn't ask people to do anything he wasn't willing to do himself. And so we, we remember this story, which is the story of our faith. Not of a distant God, not of a disinterested God, not of a God who just really wants us to be smart, but of a God who, who became flesh, who took on human flesh, Put the concepts, the principles, the teachings, the love of God on display. Put them into practice. And so we remember that on the night in which Jesus gave himself up for us, he gave us the example. And he took bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body that's broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took a cup and he gave it to his disciples and he said, drink from this. This is my blood of the new covenant. It's poured out for you for the forgiveness of your sins. Do this as often as you drink it. Every time you gather and when you do this, remember me. You're serving communion this morning. Uh, I want to go ahead and ask you to come forward. And I'm, I'm assuming we'll have a little bit of organized chaos with this. So uh, just feel free to go ahead and, and, and walk behind me and take your places as I continue and, and as we pray. So this is an opportunity for us. It's an opportunity for us, I think, to do a little bit of evaluation in our own lives, our homes, our families, our workplaces. What's the connection between what you know about God and how you live for God? What's the connection between the the principles that you know about God and the ways that you apply those principles to your life? That's really funny. Siri just said on my watch, I can't give you the answer to that question. (laughs) That couldn't, I mean... And it's true, I can't give you, she can't give you the answer, I can't give you the answer to that question, and that's why I'm asking you to pray about it this morning. <laughs> Only God can give you the answer to that question. And so, uh, so as we continue, I want to ask you to have a time of prayer in your seat. If there's something you'd like somebody to pray with you about, you could come to one of these kneelers on either side and lift your hand. We'd be honored to pray with you. And every single one of you is invited to come forward and receive communion, this tangible sign of Jesus putting his teachings into practice. So let's pray together. God, we love you. We thank you for who you are. God, we confess this morning that when we look into the mirror and when we look into our lives and when we look into our hearts, we often see a disconnect between what you've asked us to do and who you've asked us to be and what we actually do. But we thank
thank you that what you want for us is good. It's not only good, it's the best. And that when we put your teachings into practice, we begin to find life that we never could have imagined and we've never experienced before. And I pray for us this morning that we would have the courage and the boldness to learn but to do so God we thank you for who you are for your presence here for these gifts of bread and the cup we pray that in this moment you'd make them be for us the body of Christ so that we can be the body of Christ to the world so by the power of your spirit make us one with you unite us to you Unite us with each other and unite us in ministry to the world. We pray these things in Jesus' name. And so friends, as we continue to pray, these communion stations are open and this time is open and you're invited to come. Worthy of every song.